All right, here we are in part two. We're going to talk now in this study about Sunday school and VBS. Um, are they scriptural? Is this something that a Christian should be doing? All right. Now, if you're a King James Bible believer, there are three tests that you need to perform to arrive at truth. Anything at all that you hear about in this life, you have to perform three tests. Okay, number one, the first thing that you do is you say, does this exact word or phrase appear in the King James Bible? Okay. Number two, if the words aren't in the text, does the concept which the word or phrase is defining line up with what the Bible teaches? I'm going to show you a couple examples of this here in just a minute. Number three, will teaching or participating in this concept cause you to go against the Bible? Those are your three tests. Okay, I'll give you an example. The word Trinity. T-R-I-N-I-T-Y. <laughs> Trinity. Is the word in the King James Bible? No, it's not a King James Bible word. Number two, the concept of the Trinity is a concept there. The concept of the Trinity is in the Bible as the Godhead. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, John chapter 14, verse 6. John 14, 6, you see three being one. Okay, so the concept of the Trinity is there. Even though the word is not in the text, the concept is there. Number three, if you believe in the concept of the Trinity, is it going to lead you to go against what the Bible teaches? No. Believing in the Godhead is not going to cause you to contradict Scripture. So you can say the word Trinity, although the word Trinity is not in the Bible, believing in the Trinity, the Godhead would be the proper way to say it, believing in it is not going to cause you to go against what the Bible teaches. I'll give you another one. Another example here. What about video ministry slash preaching? Okay, I'm in video ministry. And I've had people say, well, that's not a Bible ministry. It's not Bible-based. Okay, look at the word video. Video ministry. Is video in the Bible? No, obviously. Video is not in the Bible. It's not a King James Bible word. Number two, Paul wrote letters and therefore communicated with people who weren't there by him in person. Okay, right now you don't see this huge congregation here that I'm preaching to. Okay, there's nobody here besides myself and my wife. So I'm making these videos to put out there to you. And thousands of people watch these videos all over the internet and they get passed around and shared and everything else. So you say, well, that's similar to what Paul was doing with writing letters. Now I realize you can still make some issues there and you can say, yeah, but you know, Paul was writing letters, you're doing video and blah, blah, blah. All right, but what's the third test? The third test is, will teaching or participating in this concept cause you to go against the Bible? Now, will me participating in YouTube, will it cause me to go against the Bible? Well, if I start to make videos to entertain you, not to teach, but to entertain, then yeah, that goes against the Bible. You become a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. You're just tuning in to see the latest video because it's fun and cool and neat to watch and it's entertaining. Yeah, then I would be going against the Bible. But me preaching and teaching on video for the world to see, people that don't have anywhere locally to fellowship with or they have small groups to fellowship with, there's nothing wrong with that according to Scripture as long as I'm not entertaining. All right? So let's ask the same principle, this principle of threes there. Let's ask the same thing now about Sunday school and vacation Bible school, all right? Because a lot of people do this, and a lot of people are going to be offended at me attacking these things, and they're going to say, how, you, how dare you? This is an established, you know, thing that the, it's so perfectly fine in the Bible. Well, let's see about that. How about Sunday school? Does the term Sunday school appear in Bible, in, in Scripture, in the King James Bible? No. The words Sunday school do not appear. Sunday is not a Bible word. First day of the week, that's in there. But Sunday, the word Sunday is not in there. All right? And if you understand the paganism thing there, Sunday, moon day, you know, it's named after pagan deities and things that the pagans would worship. Um, but anyways, Sunday is not a Bible word. School appears once in Acts chapter 19, verse 9. But it's not a reference to school for children, to a school for children. Okay? 
Number two, does the concept line up with what the Bible teaches? Does the concept of teaching children about the Bible, does it line up with Scripture? Is there, is there a problem with that? Well, not in its modern context of non-parents teaching children. See, it's perfectly fine for a parent to teach their own child about the Bible. But when you get some stranger teaching your children about the Bible, then you can have problems. And I know somebody out there right now is saying, I went to Sunday school as a child and it led to my salvation later in life. And, oh, Brother Brian, you're so far out, you know, and all this other stuff. Yeah, but you see, you're using the exception to prove the rule. Okay, that doesn't work. And again, what you say, but Brian, I can give you over 2 million documented cases of good Sunday schools that have led to people's salvation later in life. Okay, but that's not the standard, is it? The Bible's the standard. Okay, but let's continue on here. What's the history of Sunday school? Now this is interesting. You can get on the Wikipedia and you can read about where did Sunday school come from. Again, you know, it's, it's one of the funny things. And I, I, you know, again, I can relate because I went to, you know, Babel buildings for years and years. And, you know, they're called churches. And, and you just think that this is the way Christians have always done it. They've always had, you know, black leather Bibles with gold gilt edges. And they've always had the hymn book. And they've always wore Sunday best. And they always had Sunday school and youth group and the pulpit up front and the pews and the altar, this doing remembrance of me and all this stuff. People think that that's always the way it's been. But in reality, you got to question some of that stuff and you got to say, okay, is it in the Bible? Oh no, it's not in the Bible. Okay, where did this come from then? All right. So we're going to have a this article here. I'm going to just read a couple sections. I'm going to give you the link to it so you can go read the whole thing. But it says here, Sunday schools were first set up in the 1780s to provoke education to working children on their one day off from the factory. It was proposed by Robert Rakes, editor of the Gloucester Journal, in an article in his journal and supported by many clergymen. It aimed to teach the youngsters reading, writing, and ciphering any knowledge of the Bible. It was 90 years in 1870 before children could attend schools during the week. So you see, they didn't have public schooling back way back when in 1780. So they used Sunday school. They used the Babel buildings to get the kids in to train them. Hmm. Now, if you've watched the uh, study on the independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism, and you've looked at that, where did these church buildings come from? You'll understand that church buildings didn't really show up until about 1700, as far as Baptists are concerned. You know, now the other ones, they had, you know, buildings that they called churches, but that's because they were officially coming out of the Protestant Reformation. The, they were Catholics coming out and saying, we can do religion better than the Pope. So, you know, interesting that Sunday school shows up after, you know, Baptists start to meet in buildings. Coincidence, I'm sure. But continuing here, jump down to the next paragraph. It says, the Sunday school movement was cross-denominational and through subscription built large buildings that could host public lectures as well as classrooms. In the early days, adults would attend the same classes as the infants as each were instructed in basic reading. In some towns, the Methodists withdrew from the large Sunday school and built their own. The Anglicans set up their own national schools that would act as Sunday schools and day schools. These schools were the precursors to a national system of education. You mean to tell me that the Sunday schools created public school? Yeah. And it isn't it something that a lot of Christians today will radically denounce public schooling as of the devil, and yet they're all for Sunday school. And Sunday school was the precursor to public school. <laughs> Hypocrisy, brethren, come on. What are you doing? Continuing here, the role of the Sunday school changed with the Education Act in 1870. In the 1920s, they promoted sports. Hello. <laughs> Promoted sports. Go down here. England. 
The first Sunday school may have been opened in 1751 in St. Mary's Church, Nottingham. Interesting place. Another early start was made by Hannah Ball, a native of High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire, who founded a school there in 1769. However, the founding of Sunday schools is more commonly associated with the work of Robert Rakes, editor of the Gloucester Journal, who saw the need to prevent children in the slums descending into crime. So he went in there and usurped the authority of their parents to raise the children. And we'll train your children Bring them in. We'll train them. You say, Brian, I, you're against that? Well, show me some scripture to support it, and then I'll be for it. But if you can't show me scripture to support it, then I have to be against it. Because we're going to see in this study, there's really no scripture saying that anybody but you, as the parent, should be teaching your children. And I know it sounds radical. Oh, I never heard any of this stuff before. Well, does it line up with the Bible? If it lines up with the Bible, then you change you don't say, I've never heard it, therefore I reject it. Okay? The Bible is the standard. And if you can show me from the Bible that I'm wrong, okay, I'll change. But in the USA, it says here, the American Sunday School system was first begun by Samuel Slater in his textile mills in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, in the 1790s. So 1780s in England, 1790s in America. Pretty young for a movement among Christians. Hmm. Uh, form. Go down there and it says here, Historically, Sunday schools were held in the afternoons in various communities, often staffed by workers from varying denominations. Beginning in the United States in the early 1930s and Canada in the 1940s, the transition was made to, to Sunday mornings. So in other words, Sunday morning Sunday school started in, in America in the 1930s, Canada in the 1940s. You say, oh, brother, we stand here for the old-time religion, brother. We are standing here, Old Paths Baptist Church, brother. We stand for the, the church that was, you know, the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. You do not. And it's so funny to me because you get a lot of these bad-attitude Baptists, and I cut on the Baptists a lot because they're, you know, one of the only... <laughs> good, you know, denominations out there, although they got all their problems, but th there's so much attitude among some of the brethren there. But they got this attitude that they are just the one true faith, brother. I mean, just we do it the way they did it in the New Testament. No, you don't. And it's so funny to me, you got some of the bad attitude Baptists that'll cut on Catholicism because Catholicism has the Assumption of Mary, which was, they concocted the whole thing in the 1950s, but then they stand up for Sunday school, which was concocted in the 1930s. Uh, okay. You know, you better be real careful when you do this thing of, uh, you know, we believe the Bible from cover to cover, and all we're, we're, we're Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice, brother. Uh, no, most of those people that say that, they're not. <laughs> they're not Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. Maybe in faith, but not in practice. A lot of the practices of the modern Bible Baptist, you know, Babel buildings, I like to call them, uh, a lot of their practices have no basis in Scripture. None. And you wonder why, you know, why are all these people getting messed up and going off, you know, all this people that are raised in church and they go off and they get messed up and everything. Why is this going on? And why you know, Because you you're not doing it the Bible way. And you need to quit pretending that you are. Get back to the book. Exodus chapter 2. Now let's get into what the Bible actually teaches on this subject. Exodus chapter 2. Now we're going to actually see, you know, because so far I've just been kind of ranting and raving. I haven't really gotten into the scriptures yet to prove my point. So if this is where I stopped, well, you wouldn't be able to you know, you shouldn't believe me either. But I'm going to get into some scripture now and show you why I'm saying what I'm saying. Okay, Exodus chapter 2, verse 5. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women? 
that she may nurse the child for thee. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him into Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Now, who raised Moses? Was it his own mother? No, it was Pharaoh's daughter. Interesting, because Egypt in the Bible is often likened to the world. So Moses, although he was a Jew, he was a Hebrew, he would have had kind of a public schooling education. He would have been educated by the Egyptians. Very interesting there. And you say, was that a good thing? No, he had to reject what he was taught. Very interesting there. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 7 says, um, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Doesn't leave much time for uh, Sunday school or public school. Because remember, you know, I'm going to compare public school to Sunday school because public school came from Sunday school. So, um, where did it say anything there about somebody else teaching your children? You're to teach your own children. Interesting. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 21. It says here, Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. You know, one of the things that you should have around your home for decoration, the Word of God. Let it be known to people that come into your house that you're a Bible believer. Verses of Scripture all over the place. You go out the door there, and there you have Scripture on either side. And, you know, put one up above it too, and maybe one on the door, and, you know, whatever. But you should be the one that teaches your own children. That's very important. Hebrews chapter 11. Turn back to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11 verse 23 through 27 it says here by faith Moses when he was born was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment by faith Moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter you mean he went against the upbringing that he had that fine Egyptian upbringing that education that he had yeah he went against it um Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You say, well, see, Brian, that disproves you. Because, you see, Moses went through the training there, the equivalent to public schooling, you know, and he came out of it, just like you did, Brian, and just like your wife did, and just like a lot of us have done. We've come out of the public school education. So therefore, it's perfectly fine to go to public school because you come out of it, you know, and, and realize it was dumb. Yeah, but the problem is how many people have not come out of it? How many people went off to Sunday school and public school and they got messed up?
And now they hate God. Now they don't want anything to do with God. They should have been taught by their parents. You know? It's funny because I actually saw, I knew a, a brother that was a street preacher and he had on the back of his van, he had this big bumper sticker and it said, public school is child abuse. It's very true. Very true. Especially now, because if a child is bad or misbehaves in public school, they'll forcibly medicate him. And they'll threaten the parent and say, if you don't forcibly medicate your child, we're going to take your child from you. And we're going to see in the third part of this study in the video section, you're going to actually see where the children became the property of the Nazi state. And Hitler basically was telling the parents, who are you? You're going to die someday. Your children already belong to us. And that's the same situation that exists right now in America. It's the same situation. If your children are in public school, they're the property of the state. You say, oh, I don't know about that, Brian. Okay, here's a little experiment that you do. Take your children out of the public school. No explanation. It's your right, isn't it? They're your children, aren't they? How long do you think it's going to go before the public school is beaten on your door? Oh boy, we got ourselves into a mess, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And how did it start? Because a bunch of overzealous Christians wanting to convert children, put them into Sunday school, which led to public school. It's kind of funny because it's like whenever you go against God, whenever you go against the Bible, things eventually fall apart. You say, well, Brother Brian, Sunday school's not that bad. I mean, Sunday school's not that big of a sin, is it, brother? But it led to public school. And it led to the controlled state that we now have. Why? Go back to Christians that departed from the book. Problem. Big problem. Okay, turn next to Judges chapter 13. Judges. Judges chapter 13. We're going to go to uh, verse 8. This is 8 through 12. Here you have the parents of Samson. Okay, it says, Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Why didn't they just have the angel teach the child? Say, hey, just Lord, Lord you send down a public school angel, you know, and teach our child. No, he said, teach us how we're to teach our child. Interesting. Verse 9, And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste, and ran, and showed her husband, and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me, that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose, and went after his wife, and came to the man, and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we, we, order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel said, Take him to the finest private parochial schools, and give him the best education with the finest tutors, and, and you know, put him, start saving for his college one day. No. The angel instructed them how they were supposed to teach their son. Hmm. Interesting. First Samuel chapter one. First Samuel chapter one, verse twenty one. Okay, it says here, and the man Alcana, Alcana. And all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him, only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode, and gave her son suck, until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, 
with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock, and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thou so liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Okay? Now, you say, well, see, Brian, there's a child, and he was raised by somebody else. Okay? Is it the same system as our modern-day public school? No. Is it the same system as our Sunday school system? No. You don't go to the church there and you say, hey, here's my son, now you raise him. You don't do that. It's your responsibility. So don't try to use passages like that to prove that Sunday school is okay. It doesn't work. So I'm going to cover the, the passages. I know people are going to go to these types of things and try to prove, try to justify what they're doing. Turn next to Job chapter 12. Job chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. It says here, But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall, teach, or they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? You say, Brother Brian, I don't think I'm qualified to teach my children. Oh, really? Ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee and the fowls of the air and they shall tell thee or speak to the earth and it shall teach thee and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee you don't want to, one of the best ways to teach your children welcome to the classroom say what are you talking about take them out here show them what God made application you see not sitting them in some classroom someplace where they're forced into peer pressure and they're told this is the test and they say, wait a second here, this doesn't sound right. Evolution? You know, this, this stuff happened by chance, you know? I mean, you come out here and you take a child and you say, you see that? Look at that. You see that thing? Now see, son, this is random chance. I mean... You know, get that thing turned around. You know, see all the little veins and all the little things in it there? That's all just by accident. That came about billions of years ago. But see, this coat here, that was created by man. See, random chance, intelligent design. You know, uh, welcome to Cuckooville. <laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty much ridiculous. So what you do is, but you get kids away from nature, God's creation, and you stick them into a classroom someplace, and you put a little textbook in front of them, a little fairy tale Disneyland book, and you say, children, guess what? Everything that you see came from a Big Bang billions of years ago. And the Big Bang, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into a small dot no bigger than the period on this page. Now you bring people out here and you try to teach them that, they go, you're loony. But you stick them into a forced classroom under some stupid atheist infidel up there that's teaching them, brainwashing them, and you force them to believe certain things and you say, this is going to be on your test. You better not fail. And you better not question because if you question, we're going to forcibly medicate you because you have a discipline problem. And if you disobey us enough, we're going to take you from your parents and put you into a home. And that's the kind of a system that we should defend. You say, but Brother Brian, that's public school. We're talking about Sunday school. Oh, it goes on in Sunday school too. Oh, it absolutely goes on in Sunday school. There's all kinds of problems with Sunday school. You, as a parent, have a responsibility to teach your children. You say, well, Brother, that sounds like it's going to be a lot of work. Uh-huh. Yep. And you see, you've got to work that stuff out before you have children. You say, well, Brother Brian, I already have children, and they're in public school. Okay, then if you want to be right with God, and I don't mean saved, you can be saved and send your children to public school. My parents were saved the entire time they sent me to public school. Okay, but what I'm saying is if you want to be in right fellowship with God, then you'd better get your children out of public school. 
Brethren, you can do all kinds of things down here. You can sin all kinds of sins and still be saved. But if you want to be in right fellowship with God, if you want the kind of a life that God will bless, then you better do it God's way. God's standards are very high, you see. And there's a reason that they're high. It's to get you out of the quicksand, out of the mire, out of the slop of this world. And when you're doing things God's way, you can get above that filth down there. But when you do it the world's way, well, then you're in it. But continuing here, Job chapter 34. We'll continue to see some things here. Job 34, verse 32. Okay, it says here, That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Very good uh, verse there. Job's talking to God, but it's actually very true for children. You know, that which I see not, teach thou me. That should be the cry of a child to a father. Hey, I don't understand this. Teach me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Why is that a good thing with a child? Well, if he does iniquity, if he disobeys, he gets a good whack, he gets a good spanking, and then he doesn't want to do it again. See? Instruction teaching. And you see, I wouldn't want my child being disciplined and spanked by somebody I don't know. Why? They're not the parent. That's the job of the parent. Just crazy. Um, Proverbs chapter 4. You know, again, let me just say this while we're turning here. I'm not trying to make some kind of a new reformation where we go and we have this whole big, you know, return to Bible ways and stuff like that. I realize most people aren't going to return to it. But the fact of the matter is, it's like I'm rediscovering, since I've been saved, since I've been studying the Word, I'm rediscovering what the Bible really teaches. Because there's so much deception out there. And it's like, as, as I get rid of things that are deception that I've seen, hey, this is not the Bible way, I feel the Lord's blessing. I can see the Lord's blessing in our lives coming in. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make that same blessing come into your life. And as I always say, if it's not in the Bible, then don't believe me either. But if it's in the Bible, you better do it the Bible way. If you want God's blessing. If you want to go continuing on in the world and stumble along, well, keep doing it. You know, do it the world's way. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. Uh, I didn't see a Sunday school teacher in there. Hear ye children the instruction of a father. Hmm. Interesting. Proverbs chapter 5. And you can read this whole chapter too, by the way, and compare this to the thing of the modern day Babel building. We're not going to do that for sake of time. But it says here, My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discern or discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Okay, again, who's this writing? Solomon writing to his son. Now look at this, verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Did you ever see some of these Sunday school teachers or public school teachers, you know? Did you ever see some of them? Oh, hi, honey. Oh, we're going to have such a good time in our school today. We have so many games for you and prizes. And, oh, we're going to have so much fun. Uh-huh. <laughs> Bad situation. I mean, go down through and have... You know, read the whole thing there about when a strange woman teaches your children. It leads to all kinds of problems. But uh, let's look at verse 3. Or uh, wait a second here. Okay, yeah, we'll start here. Uh, verse 3, and then we'll go down through to verse 14. I'll just read verse 3 again. It says here, For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to hell, 
or I'm sorry, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, but thou canst not know them. Always have an update, you know. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Again, the, the father talking to his own children. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. How many people have gone off to some Babel building someplace, and they are lied to by their Sunday school teacher, and they end up getting older, and they continue going to the Babel building, and they then get into the congregation, and they are there for 40 years and never really learn the Bible. They're just a faithful church member, you know. Very sad. They give their years to somebody who's a stranger. They give their years to a church building. And they're told, as long as you're here and you're putting money in the plate and you're doing good things here and stuff, you're, you're right with God. They never really understand the Bible. They never really, you know, really get it. It's, it's really quite sad. And I praise the Lord for the fact that He did draw me out of that system. I was raised in it. I went to it, you know, for many, many years. Up until the time I was probably 30, no, even older than that, probably 32 years old. 32 years. And what I learned, what I now preach, what I now teach, I had to learn it outside of those Babel buildings. And, you know, one of the reasons, too, we call them Babel buildings is because that's what mostly goes on there. Blah, 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 blah. Did you see the weather? What do you think about the, the sports team? What do you think about uh, business? What, did you hear the thing in the newspaper about the blah, 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 blah? Uh-huh. And you say, I'd really like to talk about the Bible. People look at you and, you know, some kind of nut or something? Are you Are talking about the Bible at church? You're, you must be crazy. <laughs> yeah. But let's continue here. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 through 24. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the light, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Who would, you know, remember what we read there in the last study about the rod and reproof from a father to the child? Reproofs are instruction, reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep thee from the evil woman, kind of like Mystery Babylon, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Hmm. Very interesting. Turn next to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs 22, verse 6. And we went over this in the last study, but we'll hit it here while we're here again. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Who does the training? The parents, mother and father. Verse 15 in Proverbs chapter 22. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proper education requires proper discipline. Okay, and again, it's the parent that should be doing that, not some public school teacher. Proverbs chapter 23, and you know, of course, back in my day, they would spank children in public school. Nowadays, it's probably psychological counseling, you know. Instead of getting the paddle out, they, they get the pill out, you know. Uh, you know, back in my day, they had these big wooden paddles with holes drilled in them and stuff, you know, and you get nailed with that thing, you didn't forget it. But uh, nowadays, it's like, you know, it's, they don't reach for the paddle. They reach for the box of a little bottle of Ritalin or something like that. You know, <laughs> bad situation. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 22 through 26. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. 
buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Again, you see the parent there. But look here at the... Uh, Verse 24, the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Do you mean to tell me a child can be born wise? Well, I guess. But you see, there's a very interesting thing here about the word beget. Webster's 1828 Dictionary says here, beget, to procreate as a father or sire, to generate as to beget a son. Now, that's what most people think of. But look at the second definition here. To produce as an effect, to cause to exist, to generate as luxury begets vice. So another way that you can beget is actually to produce as an effect. So how could a father beget a wise child? To produce wisdom in the child. Very interesting. It's a wonderful thing when a child is instructed by their parents. When that father says, you know what? I'd much rather go out and go fishing or go do whatever fun activity I like to do. But you know something? I'm going to take my day and I'm going to take my children and I'm going to teach them. We're going to go out into the wilderness or out into the country area or something like that, into a park or wherever. I'm going to take them and I'm going to teach them. Hey, when we're driving down the road going to a relative's house or something, going to grandma's for Thanksgiving or something like that, and we're driving along and we drive past a bar, I'm going to stop, pull the vehicle over, and I'm going to say, okay, children, you see that bar over there? See those signs in the window? Can anybody read that sign there? Uh, Bud Light or Bud Wiser or something like that. Yeah. You know what that is? That's beer. You know the kind of people that go there? And you teach them what that place is. Teach them. Don't let them grow up and have to go learn that stuff on their own because you didn't have time to teach them. It's your responsibility. And you, parents, you will be held accountable. You need to beget wise children. To produce wise children. Don't say, well, brother, I got a career. I'm going to let the Sunday school teacher take care of my child. They'll take the responsibility of raising my child. I'm going to let the public school raise my child. Wrong. That is wrong for you if you're a Bible believer. Don't do that. It's your responsibility. Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29, verse 15 through 17. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multipli multiplied, transgression increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Okay, we read about that in the last study as well, but it's very important, you know, to correct your children, to discipline your children. That shouldn't be the responsibility of strangers. Turn next to Proverbs 31 verses 1 through 5. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother mother taught him. I thought it was Sunday school teacher. No. I thought it was pastor. No. Uh, school teacher? No. Private tutor? No. Mother. Verse 2, what my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink strong or to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. You know, I can say my parents did some things wrong in my upbringing, but one thing I can thank my father for was the fact that he taught us as children how stupid it is to drink. My dad was a paramedic, and so he'd go out there and he would see firsthand what alcohol did to people. And so he'd come home and he'd say, 
gather around, children, you aren't going to believe this one. <laughs> and he told us some really graphic stories. Accidents that he had been in, you know, or accidents that he had gone to and seen and the kind of things that happened to people. And, you know, that made an impression on me. And that stuck with me. And I praise the Lord, I've never had a problem with alcohol. Why? Because the instruction of my father and the reinforcement of my mother. See? And if your parents, by the way, if you can look back and say, my mother and father taught me such and such, and I'm glad for that, you should tell them that sometime. Go to them and say, you know, I know I was probably a little bit of a pain sometimes when I was little, you know, but uh, I really do appreciate the fact that you taught me about whatever. Honor thy father and mother, the Bible says. If he, or, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 Ecclesiastes 4, verse 13. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. It's kind of funny because it goes directly against the modern day system. The modern day system says that you can get wealth through your education. The end goal of education is wealth. You know, do good in high school so you can get into a good college so that you can get a good job. Uh, no. You know what real wealth is? Be content with such things as you have. Godliness, godliness with contentment is great gain. Another good thing to teach your children, you don't have to have every toy that comes out. But I want toys. I, I remember being little, you know, I, oh, I want a toy. Oh, you know, we go to the store. I got to have a toy when we go. No. But please, no. It's not your birthday. No. <laughs> you know. I didn't get everything I always wanted. And I'd go to school, you know, and I'd always have, you know, the other kids that have better toys than me and everything else. And you know what? I grew up to respect that, what my parents did for me. I'm glad they didn't buy me everything I ever wanted, you know. But to have a child that's poor and yet wise is King Solomon's right in that thing. He's actually saying a poor child who's wise is actually better than himself multi-billionaire king with a thousand women, all kinds of power, political power and everything else, and he sees some poor child that's wise, and he says, that child's better off than I am. Hmm. Oh, brother, I gotta have, I gotta, we gotta have two jobs so that my children can have everything. Uh, I can guarantee you, your children would rather have you than possessions. They would rather have you be there for them. You know, one of the neatest things for children is to have their parents actually show love to them and to say, you know what, I could go to that second or third job or whatever, but I'm going to stay home today. I'm going to take a day off and I'm going to spend it with my children. I'm going to take my children fishing. I'm going to take them go teach them how to ride a bicycle. I'm going to go teach them this. I'm going to go teach them that. Hey, we're going to get a, we're going to get a field guide on birds and we're going to go out and see how many birds we can see today and give God glory for what he's created. I'm going to take my children out and I'm going to teach them how to do firewood. I'm going to take my children and I'm going to do... Brethren, there's tons of things. And if you're a woman, you can teach your daughter how to crochet, how to knit, how to embroider, how to sew, how to do all sorts of things. And you know what? Those skills will stay with them. But when you're so busy with your career and you're coming home and you're just, I'm tired, I just want to sit down and watch TV. Go, go play with your toys or something. I'll buy you better toys so you can play with them. That's not love, brethren. That's not how God designed this thing. And getting back to the thing of Sunday school, how much better is it for a parent to teach the child the Bible than some stranger who might actually teach something contrary to what the Bible says and contrary to the rules of the parent? And, you know, I, I know Christians that have had their children in, in a Sunday school someplace and they find out that their child was taught something horrible. Turn next to Isaiah. You say, oh, not my place, brother. Hey, let me, let me just tell you something. I have known of conservative, independent, fundamental Baptists that I knew a couple, actually, and they had two daughters that were, they weren't even 10 years old yet, and they were told things about 
sexual things in Sunday school. And an independent fundamental Old Paths Baptist Church, I think was the name of the place. You say, well, my kids are safe at my Sunday school there because I know sister so-and-so that's teaching them. No way. No way. You better not let those children get out of your sight for very long. If you have other families and stuff that you know and things like that, be there, supervise those children. You start letting your children hang out with the lost world especially, <laughs> your children are going to get messed up. Again, I speak from experience. My wife speaks from experience. But uh, let's continue here. Where are we at? Isaiah chapter uh, 3, verses 4 and 5. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. And of course, you know, the modern ed education system, that's what they do. And Sunday school nowadays puts down the elderly in many of these Babel buildings that they call churches. Uh, they put down the elderly. Very, very bad. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10, verse 21. And, you know, like I said, I, I understand some of these standards, you go, man, how on earth are we ever going to get to it? Work on it, okay, a little bit by time, a little bit at a time. You got the wife working, the husband working, you're deeply in debt, got a big mortgage over your heads, and, and the children are in public school, and you're going to Sunday school and stuff. You say, you know, I'm not, exp I'm not telling you this stuff, brethren, so you can just go, boom, next week we're going to have it right. It might take you a while. Okay, it might take you a while to get out of debt. It might take you a while till you can get down to one income. It might take you a while till your your wife can get away from that and get the children out of the public school system and you can learn all that. It's going to take you a little while. It's a process. Sanctification is a process. But that's where you need to point towards. That's where you need to go, the direction you need to go in. Right? That's all I'm doing here. I'm just trying to say head in this direction because when you do, God will bless you. But when you're in the world system, God can't bless you. Continuing here, Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Has this ever happened before? Yes. This is a prophecy for the future, by the way, the time of Jacob's trouble specifically, but this has happened. And it happened in Nazi Germany. Right, there were instances where kids in the Nazi youth were told, they would tell the SS soldiers or whatever that, that were running their little youth camp, they would tell these men, my parents are hiding Jews. Because they felt such loyalty to the state. And they would actually go and take the parents off to a camp somewhere and oftentimes execute them. They would take children from parents and put them in special homes for Nazi youth. You say, well, brother, that was Nazi Germany. That's never going to happen here. Oh, I hate to tell you, it's already happening here. It's already happening here that children are being taken from their parents. Okay? Yes, I... Can I make a comment about that? When I was younger, and because I spoke truth as a child in, ele in elementary school, I was forced into psychological counseling. And the shrink told me, if you dare question this, we will put you in a home. We will take you from your parents and put mm -hmm. you in a home. Yeah. It happened to me. Yep. I was just saying, my wife was just reminding me there of, of one of the stories. Um, I don't know if that was in the testimony or not, but she said that when she was a child that uh, the psychiatrist basically threatened to take her from her parents and put her into a home. So, yeah, I mean, it, it goes on. You know, it's, it's, it's happening. But let's continue here. I'm kind of getting uh, sidetracked. Ephesians chapter 6. If you can imagine me getting sidetracked. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1. Let 
Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4 says, Children, obey your Sunday school teachers in the Lord, for this is right. Oh, I'm sorry, it says, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Huh, so fathers should bring up their own children? Yep, that's what your text says there. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 verse 20 and 21. It says here, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. A good teacher will not provoke his students to anger. You don't want to discourage your children from learning. So don't provoke them to anger, okay? Don't get an attitude and put them down and things like that. Children are going to have to learn. Sometimes they have different learning styles. Here we go again, another rabbit trail, but I have to say it. There again, public schooling, Sunday schooling. That's a forced system of everybody has to learn this way. And if you fall outside the box, well, then you're put off into another class, a special class, you know, for problem children. No, a parent needs to look and they need to say, okay, my son is very good at math, but horrible at English. My daughter, on the other hand, is very good at English, but horrible at math. Well, then I have to force them both to learn the same way. No, it takes some creative thinking there and you have to say, okay, well, how can I teach my son to be good at this and my daughter to be good at that? See, you have to think through that one-on-one. -on -one not forced into a classroom setting where you have to conform to the standards of the state or the standards of the Babel building. You see, it's, it's just so important. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 says here, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, who taught Timothy? You say, well, Timothy must have gone to a good uh, private school, right? Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So he had a godly mother and a godly grandmother. And by the way, you can learn a lot from a grandmother too. I'm not just saying parents only are allowed to teach the children and nobody else is allowed to ever speak to the children. No, there are relatives that can teach some really good things. And you might get a grandparent that has more time, they can come over, they can help out with the children, they can teach the children some wonderful things. You know, that's great. I learned a lot of things from my grandparents over the years. A lot of my hard work ethic came from watching my grandfather uh, on my mother's side. And my grandfather on my father's side was good too, but my grandfather on my mother's side, he was working outside up until the time he was in his 90s. Um, I mean, I was. I remember this one time. I'm splitting this, trying to split this stump up, with wedges and a and a sledgehammer, and I I'd hit the wedge every about th every third swing or so. I was still learning, and my grandfather came back. He was in his 80s, and he come back and he just, well, can I try a little bit, Brian? Sure. Okay. Well, here this this is a better way to do it. Ding, ding, ding. Every hit, and just smashing the stump to pieces. I mean, it was incredible in his 80s. What did I learn that day? I learned a lot. And those same things that I learned, I now use today. See, when I'm old, I'm not departing from the things that my grandfather taught me when I was young. I didn't learn it from a textbook in public school. I didn't learn it from my Sunday school teacher. I learned it from my grandfather. You say, but Brian, aren't the older women supposed to teach the children? Turn to Titus. We're going to see about that. 
First, let's go to chapter 1, verse 6. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop, bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not uh, given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding faith, fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. False prophets will go after the home many times. And you see, if the husband is off at his job and the wife is off at her job and the children are off at public school, the family starts to feel kind of estranged from one another. And we're going to see that in the next study, the next, the final part of this, that the Nazis actually encouraged children to get away from their parents. And they made their lives so busy that they didn't have much time to be at home with their parents. And what did they do? They turned those children into murderers. They turned, they turned them into fierce soldiers that would die for Adolf Hitler. Hmm. I wonder how things would have turned out if the families would have said, no, sorry, we're not going to go along with the system. And the children would have stayed there with their parents and not gone off to public school. Hmm. Interesting. But let's go look here at uh, chapter 2 in Titus, because this is where a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, the older women are supposed to be there to teach the younger children. But let's look about that. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, says here, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now who are they supposed to teach? Do you see any children there? Let's look about it. Verse uh, 4, That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and also to Okay, sorry about that. We uh, had some technical difficulties there. Uh, we've been recording a lot of videos before we head up for Maine again. And um, so, battery went dead. I wasn't keeping an eye on the battery. But uh, anyhow, continuing what I was saying here in Titus chapter 2, the fact of the matter is, it says there that the, um, verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, Discreet, chaste keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You do not see anywhere at all there in the text where it says that the older woman, older women in a local fellowship there, a fellowship of believers, you don't see anywhere where it says that those women should be teaching other women's children. It doesn't say that. It says that they are to teach the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. Okay. Better get a hold of that thing. What about Vacation Bible School? Okay, Vacation Bible School. Does that phrase appear in the Bible? No, of course not. It does not appear in the King James Bible. Um, does the concept line up with what the Bible teaches? Well, again, no, it doesn't. You know, it's, again, it's non-parents teaching children. And also, lost people's children coming in. You're trying to draw in lost people's children to vacation Bible school. That's what they do. You're encouraging parents to say, go out into your community and take children away from their homes and bring them with them to vacation Bible school. And then you're trying to get them to pray false professions of faith too. Does VBS go against the Bible? Absolutely. Yes, it does. Jeremiah chapter 32. Go there. Back to the Old Testament again. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, verses 33 and 34. It says here, And they have turned unto me the back, and not the face, though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them. Yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction, but they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. Now, how many 
of these churches out there are bringing in all sorts of worldly things, all kinds of carnal, worldly sin into the house that's called by God's name to defile it. They're doing it like crazy. And you're going to see in the third part of this video, the part three, you're going to actually see some video of modern day VBSs, and some of them are in Baptist churches. Okay? It's not all the Methodists and the Lutherans and the real modern apostate wicked. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about, you know, IFB buildings. And I've personally known about a couple where they're doing all sorts of worldly things and candy and cookies and donuts and all kinds of stuff like that to try and draw those children in. That's not of the Lord. It's very, very wicked. And again, you know, think of the philosophy here. We're going to draw in the children with all the worldly entertainment and everything else, and then when they get to a certain age, we're going to tell them that stuff is sin. Huh? Hey, you want a pixie stick? You want Coca-Cola? Come to church. They come, you give them the candy, you give them the candy, and then you say, oh, by the way, candy's actually bad for you. Well, then why did you use it to draw them in? Could it be money? No, oh, no, no, no. You're actually going to see proof of that in the next video. I'm going to actually show some, some video. They're actually showing Vacation Bible School. And as part of the video that they're showing, all the parents, everybody's happy and smiling. And, hi, hi, and hi. You know, and they show back in the office, they're there counting the money. Big smiles on their face. You know, Baptist Church. Micah 3.11. Micah. The book of Micah. Chapter 3 and verse 11. It says here, The heads therefore, excuse me, the heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Good description of the modern Babel buildings. Actually, a great description of the modern Babel buildings. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, verse 7 through 9. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Question. How many of the children that go to VBS are actually truly worshiping the Lord? How many of them are truly learning their memory verses because they care about the Bible? Or are they doing it to get prizes, candy, toys. Well, brother, as long as they're learning the Word of God, that's all that matters. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that at all. When you cheapen the Word of God into this, this thing, that you just learn it, you memorize it, you're, you know, you, and you'll see these children doing it. I used to do it, you know? So don't, again, don't tell me, oh, you know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. You learn the verse, you know, while you're on the way to your Babel building that night, and then you just repeat it as quickly as you can so that you can get your prize. That stuff isn't of the Lord, brethren. Come on. Ephesians 4.14. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 says that we be... be Excuse me, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And again, as I said in the last study, I read that verse. You know, children are tossed to and fro. You know, you're going to bring them in there and you're going to try to teach them doctrine, you know, and good times and candy and games and, you know, what is this stuff? It's not of the Lord. It just is simply not of the Lord. And uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. Go there next. 
You say, well, Brian, I just can't agree with you. I think this stuff is wonderful. Okay. Titus 3, or 2 Timothy 3, 4 says, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. What I want you to do is, I want you to say, all right, Vacation Bible School, come on out. What we're going to do is we're going to have a real Bible, Bible school. We're going to teach children for three hours of preaching. We're going to teach them dispensationalism one night. We're going to teach them creation science. We're going to teach them about the Bible version issue, manuscript evidence. We're going to teach them about, you know, pro prophecy fulfilled and prophecies yet to be fulfilled. We're going to, you know, you think how many, how many children do you think would show up for that? Probably none, unless their parents forced them to come. But if it was up to them, free will, they wouldn't come to that. You say, but we can draw them in with games and cookies and candy. Uh, then they become a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. And again, I, like I said before, you draw them in with the, the, the things of the world, then you later you tell them the world's wrong. How does that work? It doesn't work, brethren. Break the cycle here. It's time to say, hey, we admit we're in error. It's time to go back and say, this stuff isn't in the Bible. We need to quit. Oh, but you see, Brother Brian, I got this building, and we got payments to make. And I mean, you know, I got a salary that I make from the building. And Second Peter chapter 2. Someday you're going to stand before God, you know. You're going to answer. You know, and I realize a lot of the brethren don't think too much of me. They think, oh, he's just an idiot, and he's a nut, and everything else. You know, he's retarded. I had one guy say to me. You know, he's just a nothing, he's a nobody. Okay, but you know what? If what I'm saying lines up with the Bible, then someday you're going to answer to God. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm, get, I'm trying to get you to realize that coming judgment and that you better get right for that. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now, I'm fully aware of the fact that many of the brethren out there, you're not a false prophet, but you're continuing the VBS thing because of covetousness. Oh, no, brother, no, not that, not that. We want to see souls saved. Come on, come on. Children do not have the mind. Children that are in the average VBS, they don't have the mind to understand that they're truly sinners and that, to understand what salvation is all about. Okay? Their minds are foolishness. They can't understand these things. They can't discern between good and evil. Just look at the last study. I proved that from Scripture. They don't have the mind for it. Why are you drawing them into your building? Why? To get their parents to come because their parents have wallets. They have paychecks which you can tap into. But you see, if that's where it ended, it would still be bad. But the fact is, it goes even farther than that. Because you see, what's happening is, by these children being brought into these Babel buildings and being forced to go to Sunday school and forced to be part of the programs and forced to be part of all this stuff, it begins to, pre to, to create resentment. And because they were falsely converted as a young child, they start to create that Resentment breeds and breeds and breeds. They get into their late teens, early 20s, especially if they go to public school or go to university someplace. And they get to a point where they say, I hate God. I don't want anything to do with church. I don't want anything to do with this Bible stuff. I'm out of here. So what you do is you make them twofold more the child of hell. You make that person like the dog that returns to his vomit and the sow that's washed to her wallowing in the mire. You make them worse off than if you had never even messed with them. You say, Brian, you're really saying a lot of controversial things here. 
yeah, compared to what is considered modern day church, I understand that. But you say, then what should church be? Well, church should be what it is here in the New Testament. And what it is, is you bring the Christians in. And it's Christians that meet together with other Christians. And you have a bunch of older men there, elders, so that one of them can't lord over the flock, you know. And you have these men that are all accountable to each other. And these men teach the Bible. And you can sit around, you can read the Bible, you can study the Bible. You say, what about the children? We have to do something for the children. Brethren, there again, this movement of the youth, the youth, it's the youth, it's the youth. That stuff is rooted in the occult. It's rooted in Nazism. I'm going to show you that in the next video. This thing of, of tapping into that youth thing and, and the youth. You are the future. Yeah, the future is built on you and all this stuff. That stuff isn't of God. You know what the youth need to do? The children? If they're real young, put them in the corner over there. Play with your toys. Be quiet. See? It's kind of weird because the bishop, you know, the position of a bishop, it says there that he's to be given to hospitality and that he's to rule his own house well. Kind of almost like uh, the saints are meeting there in his house and he has his children in subjection. Wow, there's a new thought, you know. You have the fellowship there together. There's young children. You set the young children over in the corner and you say, quietly play with your toys or collar in your collaring book. The children get older, teach them the Bible. Wow, there's a novel idea. And when they get to that certain age and they start to realize and they start to figure things out on their own and they say, you know what? I can read the Bible for myself. This Bible says I'm a sinner. Yeah, I've done some things that would qualify me for being a sinner. I think I better get saved. Now they're ready for salvation. Not because they were put through some happy little VBS Sunday school thing and they came out and they're, they're guilt tripped into praying a prayer of salvation. And if you're here today and you don't know for sure, you know, and all this stuff, and you create a false convert doing that. That's not the Bible way. It's not the Bible way. Parents are to teach their own children. That's the way it should be. And we're going to conclude this study and we're going to go on to the last and final part and I'm going to show you the parallels between what happened in Nazi Germany and what's happening right now in 2013. You say, oh no, Brian, not, not a thing like that. The, you know, Nazi German, <laughs> Nazi Germany, that's in the past, brother. That's never going to happen again. Oh, actually, no, it's happening right now. You see, you go back there when the Hitler Youth Movement was really getting heated up and really starting to get powerful, it'd be pretty much like today. People back then, they just said, hey, this youth movement's going to end up being in a horrible army and there's going to be war and death and all this stuff. And people had gone, it's just youth groups. It's just youth working together. But I'm going to show you in the study that the same propaganda that Hitler was using has been tweaked and twisted and it's now even more dangerous. And there are actually churches down south that are already training their people for military service. You say, you mean public schools? I mean churches. They're already in military uniforms conducting military drills. I'm going to show you. So watch the next video and you're going to see all the proof that you want and probably some that you don't want. Um, we're going to be showing you some videos and I'm going to be showing you that there is not only just military stuff, there's occultism in this modern VBS stuff. It is bad, brethren. It is worse than I realized. When we, my wife and I, when we started to do the study for this, we kind of thought, ah, you know, we'll make some tie-ins here and there and stuff. Then we realized that Sunday school actually was the precursor for the public school. And then we realized that there's all this other socialism stuff going on. And then it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So you're not going to believe what's in the next video. So please tune into that. Thank you for watching this video. And sorry about the little problem there, the technical difficulty with the battery. But uh, uh, join us in the next video. Thank you for watching.